In this episode, we chat with commercial photographer and filmmaker Donald Maloney. We discuss some of his self-initiated projects and how they have landed him in some very unusual situations. I'm Jerry O'Dwyer and this is How Are Things. It's interesting your last, say, five to ten years, the projects that you've kind of uh, generated yourself. It's almost like a complete flip side of the coin of your commercial work. In advertising, often the shoots, while beautiful and very interesting, they can be kind of contrived, where your stuff is very journalistic, your personal projects, I think. That's exactly it. I mean, I do, I do love the whole photojournalism thing. I think some of, some of the best photographers that, that ever lifted a camera were photojournalists, you know what I mean? I, and I never had any great sort of... Uh, I never had any great sort of uh, love for for the greats, if you like, of, of photography, like the David Bailey's. Not, not that I didn't like them, but, but I was always much more impressed by, by photojournalists, you know what I mean? They, 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 seem, to be, they seem to be a little bit more um, proactive um, and, and a little bit more creative and a little bit more, because they kind of, you know, shoot from the hip kind of thing. So they were, they were always under pressure to get stuff. So I kind of like that kind of pressure. Um, which spawned a couple of ideas that I worked from from before. I mean, once I got an idea and be had, I just go bald bald headed for it. I have to do it. Do you know what I mean? Right. Yeah. Yeah. I have to get it off my table and I have to finish it. Do you shoot pretty much every day if you can? Like, do you have to? Are you happier with a camera in your hand than you are walking around without one? Absolutely. Yeah. Absolutely. Um, I try to shoot something every day, even if it's something for a little Instagrammy thing, anything at all. I just I just try and keep my eye kind of. Uh, match fit if you like you know what i mean just yeah. uh, at the ready so i i do like i do look at things it's, it's very hard for me to walk down the street without sort of looking at something in a different way or looking for an angle or looking for uh, a composition or something like that so yeah no i've always got a camera with me and it might necessarily be around my neck but I've, i'll always have one whether it be in the car or within walking distance if you like but uh, more often than not it's 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 with me at all times if you find a camera can kind of open doors it's almost a mask it kind of uh, emboldens you sometimes if you have even to approach people or to do whatever because i saw your uh, lovely film you did with the um, uh, gentleman martin yeah i mean it, it didn't start out as a documentary it started out, out as a as a as a personal project i was very interested in shooting um uh, uh the people of the streets if you like people who, who were who were less privileged than ourselves, particularly the homeless and that. And I went through a period for about about two months whereby I literally trawled the streets at nighttime looking for visually interesting homeless individuals. It sounds sounds very uh, sounds a bit pathetic, but I do find that whole um, stressed look very interesting photographically. But then I thought it would be nice to put a story to these guys and um, I went through a couple of months of doing that and um, doing shots, portraits of people in alleyways and wherever else and, and getting a little bit about their background. Everyone seemed to have a similar story and I, I actually got bored with it, um, even though I enjoyed the photographic aspect of it. Um, till I met Martin and, and Martin was an exception to the rule. Martin was um, much more interesting than the other people I'd met. So I just concentrated my, my time on Martin and befriended him, if you like. And, yeah. um, I, still see him, I still see him to, the, to this day, which is, um, I only met him there the day before yesterday. And uh, um, that's seven years later. So, I mean, I don't see him as often as I used to, but I still keep yeah. in regular contact with the guy. And he's still as unsociable as ever. Do you know what I mean? He's still very, very standoffish and, and whatever, but I'm, I'm never going to change that. But um, we have a friendship, but not in, not in the friendship that, you know, that me and, me buddy that I used to live down the road from have, but it's it's more of a sort of a it, Martin never let anyone get close to him, so yeah. I, I don't know. I'm probably as close as I, as anyone has got. So he's a friend, but he's not he's not my closest friend by any stretch of the imagination because you just won't, you won't have that. Can I ask you, was it Urban Penn said he loves he only likes to photograph people over sixty five when the face is so similar to what you said about the rugged decayed look when the face is really. Yeah. It, it kind of uh, becomes the character it's meant to be. Who do you like to photograph? Do you have any preference? Well, I mean, a, a bit like Irving. Penn. I mean, I, I, I do love, uh, I just prefer people with, with a bit of character in their face. Like, I mean, there's lots of pretty people and we're all sick of looking at photoshopped people and pretty girls. Yeah. And so, uh, for example, I make it a pilgrimage every year to go down to Ballon the Slow to the, to the horse fair in Ballon the Slow. Right. I know that's not very popular with, 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 with the animal, uh, rights people and all that but god almighty they really come out of the woodwork down there jerry you want to see them 
It's fucking fantastic. <laughs> and there, there's, there's loads of great characters as well, even if they don't have the face. Um, so I really, really enjoy that. And it, kind of, it spawned a document, little documentary I'd done a couple of years ago about a guy down there called Eddie who I had met. And uh, yeah, so I do, I do love that thing. And, 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 it, and not just Bal and the Slow, but I mean, I do, I do find uh, characters very interesting. And even with the documentary work that I'm doing now, um, I, I do like the portraiture aspect of videography as well do you know what i mean yeah, yeah. Um, like th there's a documentary i'm making about two guys now and uh, it's all it's all about getting into the heads of people really do you know what yeah. i mean and I, I find that much more interesting and um i have a partner who, who, who i've been living with now for the last um four years or so and uh she's a writer mm. which is very very helpful um uh, she puts manners on me when I, when I when I you know go off the rails and, and forget the storyline. If you understand what I mean. Sure. Yeah. Yeah. So yeah, she puts a bit of structure in, into to what what I'm shooting documentary wise, but she doesn't advise me on anything visual really. So. I loved her so much. I really did. She was a pure angel. After Teresa dying, I didn't know how I'd cope. But there was always one more thing in my life that I really loved, and that was the horses. When did you first become aware of photography? Not as in actively doing it, but when did you first think, geez, this is something I would actually devote my life to, this is something I'd like to do? Well, it was always a kind of a glamorous thing. I don't know, but I don't I know, you're not as old as me, Jerry, but, uh, but, but when I was a kid, uh, to be a photographer was to be something that's very glamorous. Um, hmm. uh, it's, it's no longer the case, really. I think photographers back in the day were, were almost magicians. They were, they were sort of lauded. They were, they were they were geniuses. They were they were untouchable. They were they created magic. Um, now everyone's creating magic. You know what I mean? So so the mystery has gone out of photography to a large extent. But I suppose um, it's always been. I didn't really get into photography till I was about eighteen or nineteen years of age. So quite late, really. I mean, my uncle gave me an old Russian camera called a Zenith. I think they're I think they're Russian, right? and um, it was the most beautiful thing I'd ever felt. You know, you have this solid piece of, uh, of of steel in your hand that could make these beautiful images, and I fell in love with the instrument. And then the the the, the aspect of creativity, then it just it just it just became an infatuation. Then very very quickly. Yeah. Um. So, but professional photography never really crossed my mind till uh, till my late twenties. Yeah. Um. It wasn't because I really wanted to become a professional photographer. I kind of hated the job I was working in at the time and I needed to get the fuck out. And someone said to me, why don't you just give the photography a go? You're really good and you should give it a go. And you give it. And uh, I just done the crazy thing of giving it a go. Mm -hmm. um, and just concentrated on the world of advertising uh, because it seemed the most lucrative at the time. <laughs> it was at the time. You're very well known for uh, predominantly uh, working with people. I've been on one or two of your shoots. We've worked on a few, uh, couple of jobs over the years. And you do have a very, and it can be quite entertaining, knack of pulling a performance out of someone. How do you deal with, say, a nervous or an unwilling subject? Or have you met any over the years that were, you're getting nothing from them? Did you have any little uh, tricks of the trade when you're to, trying to coax a bit of life out of someone? I don't need to say. I don't need to say there's any tricks. It's probably just my own personality. Even as a kid, I was very, very flamboyant, and I, I tried to, you know, be the centre of attention. And you know, I, I was never shy in any way. And if I was, I counteracted that by being the complete opposite. So uh, I'd never any problem communicating with people when I wanted to, when I felt like I needed to entertain to get some attention or whatever. So uh, I do enjoy the company of uh, of interesting people, no matter what what their their job or whatever but so i do seek out people who are a little bit more interesting but with regard to my own sort of technique again the performance out of people um i know I've, I've never had a problem with that and i think it probably in all the years that i've been doing it i've only ever encountered two or three people max that that i thought god i'm never going to get a performance out of this guy you think you know the guy and jesus they're, they're so used to cameras in front of them and 
to, I won't mention the names of the people. Mm-hmm. And you think that when you put a camera in front of this person, it'll be second nature to them. Yeah. But two of the people that froze on me over the years have been actually people who have been in front of a camera for years. But it's but a a, a, um, a TV camera or whatever. So, yeah. uh, but what stuck a stills camera in front of them was like, holy shit, they're, they're actually freezing here. Mm. So uh, that's when I'd have to get into my old full, acting the full routine and whatever. And, and you do what you can. But I genuinely enjoy the company of people and, and, and making them feel, feel at ease and making them feel that they're contributing yeah. to the shoot as well. Do you know what I mean? That they have to see that I'm enjoying it. If I'm not enjoying it, they'll know I'm not enjoying it. And, it works. It works both ways. So why yeah. not have a bit of crack? I mean, we, we do get well paid for 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 what we do, and um, why not make it a pleasant experience for everyone? You've been in the game for maybe how many how many years have you been at it? Maybe twenty five, thirty, sort of. You would have been very much in the game when it was uh, analog. You know what I mean? Uh, shooting. Uh, yeah. Slide. Now there's nothing personally as soul destroying as receiving a disc with say three hundred and sixty seven identical images. <laughs> Has it changed your uh, approach to shooting? analog versus digital well firstly um i don't miss that analog world word at all i mean this i noticed that there's there's a there's a new uh there's a bit of a surge now to go back to analog from certain photographers and this that and the other and if i jerry if i never saw another dark room again it'd be too soon do you know what i mean i i just i'm so delighted to get out of that dark room um and uh Anyway, that's another day's work. I could argue with other photographers all day about that. But um, but I do understand how accessible everything is now. And I I loved it back then. And it's the, it's the best learning you'll ever get. It really is the best learning you'll ever get. And it has stood to me to this day. Um, and, I, and, and it's helped me, helped me understand light and understand the technical aspect of photography much more than any anything else anyone now is, 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 is beginning to learn. Uh, so yeah, no, I appreciate all that. That's that's all being fantastic, but but um, I don't miss it. I love I love the digital world. I think I think it's fantastic, and you know it knows no bounds. How have you found the uh, the landscape has changed in the last thirty years? Has there been any uh, high points in terms of uh, periods of great work versus? There was a certain group of photographers uh, here, there, here and there that, that just they just had something extra on, on the rest of the guys. Whereas now there's just so many. I mean, and don't get me wrong, there's loads of talented guys around now as well, but there just doesn't seem to be as many rock star photographers as there used to be. Um, but has it changed? Um, yeah, it has. It has. The, 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 the technique and the style of photographer has changed enormously. Um, whether that be for the better or not, I'm not so sure. But um, I, I haven't seen anything in the last five to 10 years where I actually went and thought, shit, I wish I had done that. Or, uh, wow, that's amazing. I'd love to have done that. I haven't seen too much of that. Mm. Whereas I used to see a lot of that, you know, 15, 20 years ago, I'd go, fuck, that's amazing. Any advice you'd give your 20 year old self? It's a pretty stock question, but it's an interesting one. Is there anything that you would have done differently uh, had you known back then? Um, on my 20 year old self, um, I probably would have got, I hate to say it, but I probably would have gone to art college. Um, I never went to art college or anything like that. But I believe there's advantages and disadvantages in being to art college. Um, and that's, that's another day's work. Um, I, never, uh, I never assisted as a photographer. I never sort of, you know, assisted any other top photographer. I never done that. I'm just totally self-thought. So I'm kind of proud of that in a way because... I was never influenced by by someone to become a clone of them of them, you know. So, um, and that that can happen. So, uh, would I give myself any advice? No, I, I I don't think so. Um, I would like to have got into um, shooting video a bit a bit more and shooting movies and documentary. If I do have one little regret, is the fact that I didn't shoot start shooting that a bit earlier. Um, mm. because there's so much so much stuff now I want to do. Um, I'm not any younger, so there's only a certain amount of time left to, to get all those things in that, 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 I, that I should have done 20 years ago. Um, and I'm only shooting documentary four or five years. So it's kind of new to me, but it's like a new lease of life. It's like I've discovered photography again, really, to be honest yeah. with you. Brilliant. It's, 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 it's great. I wouldn't have that if I knew, knew what I knew 
when I was in my twenties or whatever. So yeah, I got a new. So I've no real regrets now. I'll ask you maybe about one or two of your own personal projects before I let you back to your day. Um, intruders, the uh, where you basically found uh, looked for lots of old derelict homes. They must have been very um, poignant places to be in. A bit spooky and a bit maybe emotional at times. Were they? Were you kind of uh, documenting stuff as you saw it? Yeah, I like the whole Urbex, Rurex thing, um, Urbex being urban exploration thing. Um, so I've always been fascinated by um, old abandoned buildings and and, uh, and uh, just, this sounds terrible, but just the excitement of breaking into these buildings is, is, is great and trying to discover something that, that might, you know, tell me a bit more about the building and whatever. And photographically, they're fantastic as well. Um, so that became a bit, I went, bald headed for that for, for a couple of years, um, literally, you know, infiltrating these uh, houses and factories and, and power plants and whatever. And um, I even went abroad and done a couple of couple abroad. So yeah, that became a real passion. Um, and the, the intruders thing was uh, kind of a byproduct of, of all that when I discovered um, I think most young photographers, you know, they, they, want to, they want to do fashion. I've got to do fashion because I'll meet loads of beautiful pretty girls and I'll be a big hit and, and all the rest. I never got into the whole nude photography thing. I think a lot of young guys just want to do, get the nude thing out of the way, really have, have to do that. So I, it wasn't until my 50s that I decided, that, hmm, I better do this nude thing now. See, so it was like, um, I'm not saying it's not intriguing, but it did intrigue me. Um, but I thought if I could take these nudes and incorporate with, with, incorporate it with the... Uh, with the project I'd been doing about the whole urbex thing, the abandoned building thing, kind of make it look pretty and whatever, uh, it, it might be an interesting project. So I spent about um, six months uh, driving around finding my six or seven favorite abandoned buildings around the country. And then I managed to um, get my hands on, I was like, geez, get my hands on, that's wrong. Uh, find a few, la <laughs> a few ladies, who, who are willing to, to participate in the project. So it was literally smash and grab photography. Um, we, we, we'd, uh, we'd infiltrate the place, you know, um, but I would do a recce the week before, find all the good angles. And um, I'd bring this little chair along with me when I was doing the, the, the recce. It was just a regular um, uh, kitchen chair. So that was my sort of scale model. So when I get into this building, I'd know, okay, I'm going to have about an hour here before, max before I'm, security or called or whatever so i'd be placing the chair in the middle of the building or in the corner of a building or in the corner of a corridor or whatever and shoot, shoot uh shit the chair looks good there um, um and chair became another project but anyway that's another day's work um so chair was the chair was the, was the, was the the uh the scale model for the for the actual intruders project so yeah. one thing spawns another spawns another kind of yeah thing. yeah so yeah your recent documentary that you mentioned, it's called Quattro... Quattro Colori, Four Colours. How did that come about? Um, two years ago, um, I had, uh, I was, I, I went to Florence to uh, shoot a, an event in Florence called uh, uh, Calcio Storico. It dates back to um, Roman times, basically. The, the, the Romans used to play this game called Harpastum. And it was used to keep the troops fit, um, the legionnaires or the centurions, to keep them fit when they weren't at war. Mm. And it was quite, quite violent. Um, and uh, that sort of died a death when the Roman Empire died. But the people of Florence um, started, started playing with it again in, in, in the sort of uh, 16th century. Mm -hmm. And it became part of the tradition in Florence. So uh, they do it every year. There's four districts in Florence. You have the red, the blue, the green, and the white districts, which is represented by four, four churches, Santa Croce, Santa Maria Novella, Santa Gloria, and blah. And um, they get it on once a year and beat the shit out of each other, basically, in this uh, piazza called Santa Croce, mm. which, is this, which is overlooked by the church, Santa Croce where Michelangelo and some other of the greats are, are buried. And Dante overlooks this sort of, um, this piazza where it all takes place every June. So there's two semi-finals in the final every year um, 
in June in um, in Florence. So I had been going bald to try and find a way of getting in to see this event or shoot it basically. And it was a totally it was a it was a no no because they they, they don't like non Italian photographers covering it for whatever reason I don't know. Anyway, I had to lie through my back teeth and uh, do a lot of stuff that I shouldn't be doing to try and get myself um, an, an interview in the Palazzo Vecchio uh, to try and get a um, a pass to get into this event uh, or these events, the two semi-finals and the finals. So I had to, f they firstly wanted me to have, a, have an actual, um, a written, uh, permission from from a newspaper as a commission, so that I was to, firstly to prove to them that I was a professional photographer and that this was a real commission, that this wasn't me just acting the mick, which it was, of course. But but and, and subsequently, um, a newspaper actually did use it. The, the, the Indo used it in their Life magazine as a four or five, six page pullout or whatever it was lovely, uh, and it was fantastic. So I done that in two thousand and eighteen, and it's a long, long story, Jerry, that that, that I had to go through in the Palazzo Vecchio mm -hmm. and lie to these people in this fucking room and whatever, and being told not, you know, you can't do this, and me throwing my arms around like an Italian going crazy, and, and all the rest, uh, begging them and. Anyway, I'd done it in 2018. When I came home, I had a look at the shots and I thought, geez, it'd be a fantastic documentary. What? How am I going to do it though? I haven't got a word of Italian. Um, so when I was there, I met a guy called uh, Gianni Vanucci, who's, uh, who's an undercover cop in, in Florence. And he helped me organize the documentary. What he done is he, he found one guy in each district, from each of the four districts. Right. And I documented the, with these guys' lives um, for the seven months leading up to the actual event in June. So I used to travel back and forward from Florence. Um, uh, it's totally self-funded as well. So this wasn't a cheap little little project that I just I, 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 I discovered for myself. And uh, yeah, it just grew from there. It just, I didn't know how it was going to go, but it went really, really well. I really enjoyed it. And um, but luckily enough, my, my partner uh, also speaks fluent Italian. So I brought another DOP with me as well. So we were shooting with two cameras. Um, so everybody could speak Italian except me, the director kind of thing. So uh, it was brilliant fun. Oh, yeah, the hardest thing I've ever done, but brilliant fun. So come here, what's, uh, what's next in line for you? What's next in line? Okay, here's the thing. I've been shooting this thing for, for, for nearly 26, 27 months. I don't know if you remember, uh, two lads got married Christmas 2018. Um, 2018, 19, yeah, 2018, two lads got married here. And one guy was 58 years of, guy, of age, and the other guy was 84. They got married to avoid an inheritance tax bill. The bill yeah, so the, so the papers. Yeah. Right? <laughs> it turns out I knew the old guy, the guy who's 84. It turns out I actually knew him because I used him in, in one of my abandoned buildings in a shoot 10 years previous or something like that. And uh, someone rang me the day before the wedding and said, Donald, you, 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 you know this fucker. I said, who, who, what, what's going on? He said, he's getting fucking married tomorrow to another bloke. I said, but he's straight. He says, oh, look. so I said, uh, <laughs> what's going on? He says, I said, I'll ring him, I'll ring him, I'll ring him. So I rang him and he says, yeah, I'm getting married tomorrow and this, that and the other. And, and I said, uh, hold, where are you now? He says, I'm in a cafe. I said, well, hold on there. I'll be over in an hour or so. So myself and uh, Patricia, my partner, hopped in the car with a camera and a few questions. And we ended up in this cafe over in Stony Batter interviewing your man and his friend. And I thought, and you're getting married tomorrow. And how did this all start? And it started out as a bit of a, a thing between the two of them. I mean, I won't go into the whole story, but there's an amazing story to, to, to behind. These two guys have two, the basis of their story is amazing. The whole inheritance tax thing is just mm. one layer of the onion, really. Uh, and, um, so yeah, I've been working on that for the last um, 26 months. But sadly, the, they did get married the next day. But sadly, the, the old guy the, who's died um, in January. So that kind of um, put a halt to a lot of the shooting. But there's other things I have to do and whatever. But that's at a pretty advanced stage. But it's, 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 I'm very excited about that because it's very entertaining as well. As well as, uh, <laughs> I can <you> know, imagine. <laughs> <laughs> well, it is great fun. I appreciate you having a chat with me again soon, all right? All right, Jerry. Thanks a million. See you.